Okay. Thank you everybody for attending today. Um, it's my pleasure to present this latest webinar regarding biosecurity planning and implementing actions. This is a follow on from um, the session we delivered last week, which is stepping you through some of the questions that commonly occur when we're thinking about biosecurity. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional land owners of the lands on which we are meeting today. Um, for myself, it is the Yorty Order people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Now, when we talk about biosecurity, one of the, one of the blocks that we utilise is PICS. Now, PICS stand for Property Identification Codes. Now, you might realise that a number of the a bit of the information on the screen currently is really only relevant for Victoria, particularly for what the PIC is and some of the requirements surrounding it. But basically, to break down a property, a PIC is a property where livestock is kept, including bees. Um, you can also have a PIC in Victoria um, for a number of horticulture, um, horticulture crops. Uh, particularly things like chestnuts um, and vineyards will have a pick, as well as you if you own uh, one or more hives, you you also require a pick. So basically, a pick is allocated to a property consisting of more than one block of land, um, and in Victoria, it's probably very similar in other states. Um, updating that pick is incredibly important, particularly changes of ownership or manager details. It's very important that we get them as updated as possible. And in Victoria, that's within 28 days. Now, the reason that picks are important, um, it's not only from emergency animal disease response situation, it's also um, in Victoria, we use the PIC system um, to responding to natural disasters. So we used the PIC system when we responded to last year's statewide floods. We've done it um, for the 1920 bushfires, uh, storms in Gippsland and so on and so forth. So having accurate data um, doesn't have to be numbers of livestock, it just up-to-date contact details, who owns or who manages that property. Um, and their contact details are really important. It enables us to get in hold, get get in touch with you a lot sooner, and it enables us to improve the accuracy um, of any reporting that needs to be done. Um, so, if you do have, if you do have, need to update your pick, um, that that in most cases it can be done online um, via your state ag department. Now, next step after that is uh, the NIS database and traceability. Why traceability is important is it basically gives us market access, uh, food safety, emergency disease control, endemic disease monitoring. Um, basically, if you're going to have livestock on the property and you're going to move them off, um, you're going to have to get an NLS account, um, and you can also have to basically register for LPA. Um, getting an NLS account is relatively easy. You can do it online. You can log on and register online. Um, now, the reason that's important is uh, this bottom picture. So this bottom picture represents sheep movements um, for one particular day. So blue is movements into sale yards and red is movements out of sale yards. And as you can say, for just one day, these are the movements that occurred. Now these movements um, went all the way into South Australia, they went into New South Wales, they also went into Queensland. So that's why we introduced um, NLS. That's why we also, we also introduced um, sheep tags in Victoria. It enables us to keep a track of where sheep are going 
um, and makes the reporting and trace back a easier and more consistent. Um, so that's basically why we do it. The background to that is during the UK's FMD outbreak, um, sale yard to sale yard transfers were one of the key early um, risks and transmitted a lot of the early um, risk uh, from sale yard to sale yard as, they, as sheep were moved around the UK. Um, so keeping a track of where they're going is very important. Now, next step is identifying the risks. Now we talked about this in last week's um, presentation. How do they get onto your farm? How do they get into the community? Now, often it's introduction of animals or plants. That's often the biggest risk, particularly on farm, as well as into Australia. It's introducing an animal that wasn't there previously or who is naive into that area um, and the risk that that, they, that, they, that that poses. The next level is introduction of fodder and supplies, particularly if you're bringing um, particularly grains or hay from different areas, they, they also pose a disease risk, particularly weed seeds, um, access points, boundary fences, waterways, um, is another key risk. Visitors and equipment. Uh, so everybody's pretty familiar with the risk that visitors pose, particularly um, at the border, having to go through disinfectant mats, disinfectant baths and show, show the soles of their footwear. Um, so that's the fomite risk that we talked about last week. Uh, the next level is aerosol, windborne spread and in insects. Um, so they're, they're often things that are a lot harder to control, particularly when we're talking about insect spread or windborne spread. Um, they're a lot harder to control. So it's about how do we manage them accurately? So it's how do we respond? How do we put in place procedures to recognize um, any incursion that might've occurred due to those risks? Now, when you're documenting your plan or thinking about documenting your plan, you've got a number of different formats that this that this can occur, that this can occur on. So the first one up there is the New South Wales Education Biosecurity Plan for Schools Teaching Agriculture. Um, that's a great plan. It's similar to most other plans and templates that are out there. Um, they've just got a couple of added areas um, as well as suggestions about how do you manage them day to day um, if you've got a school farm. Your next common one is the on-farm biosecurity plan template. Um, so this is the 2017 edition. This is the most recent edition. Um, very similar cover page, very similar material, breaks it down into um, seven, six to seven different areas. Your next one is your LPA plan. Um, this is a very good biosecurity template. Um, it's very detailed. It enables you to choose the level that you want to look at. Um, it's also got uh, various sections, particularly if you're in Queensland, with the biosecurity obligation with your GBO or general biosecurity obligation. It's also got um, your Yoni's status declaration, particularly if you have uh, beef cattle. So they're the general templates that we talk about and they're the general templates that get used um, by producers, by farmers, as well as by schools that I've come across, they're the most common, or you could develop develop your own. There are a number of different ones. Um, if you want to pay, you've also got um, AVA, so the Australian Veterinary Association have got their own system um, that's vet-led, um, that's a paid for application, you have to pay for that. 
and the vet will do that for you. Now, the first one that often gets it, that often comes up, particularly in templates, is inputs, particularly livestock. And as I said earlier, it's a lot easier to exclude the disease than it is to respond to it. So the first most common thing is avoid buying the disease. Avoid buying the disease, weed or pest into your farm. So basically know what you're buying when you buy it. Um, so it could be buying from a reputable breeder, be it an animal, be it a plant. If it's a plant, be it, buy it from a reputable nursery or a reputable um, seed seed agent. Um, make sure that if you've got livestock that they're identified and the movement to the school property recorded in occurrence with the NLS rules for your species and jurisdiction. That's very important because the last thing you want is you to be sent a letter um, by your agency, by your state agency saying um, that an illegal movement or an Ill incorrect movement has occurred. Next step is inspect the animals on arrival, induct and quarantine. Now, often, particularly if you're buying stud animals, they'll come with animal health certificate or you can ask for pre-testing to occur. It gives you um, a sense, of, it gives you security that you know what you're buying. But even if you don't, make sure that you drench, vaccinate, lot, treat for lice or foot bath, depending on the species that you're buying. A very good recommendation is you quarantine. Isolate for 7, 14 or 28 days. Most plants talk about either 21 or 28 days in quarantine. Now, as I said in last week's presentation, the reason we quarantine is it enables any symptoms of any disease that might be present um, to occur and enables you to either retreat and respond to those symptoms. Now, consider that some diseases only present themselves in certain seasons. Uh, best case is foot rot and sheep um, coming into autumn and winter. If you've got wet conditions, um, that's where you'll see an uptick of that. Now, you've got to remember that quarantining um, and inputs also others livestock that return to your property from adjustment or from shows. So if you do have a show a show team at your school, make sure that you examine if quarantine is going to work because um, you've got to remember that you're taking your animals to a different location. You're stalling them next to other animals, maybe for a couple of days. They could have nose to nose contact over, over yards, over fences, so they could pose a risk. So that's something that you've got to consider if you've got show teams or you're bringing animals back from adjustment. Now, a key part of that is documentation. So NVDs, that they're pretty standard across Australia, particularly if you're part of LPA, for cattle and sheep, both have NVDs, as well as goats. You can get goat NVDs. Now, NVDs are illegal documents. Receivers and sellers must keep the NVD for seven years. Um, that's in Victoria. I think similar legislation applies uh, nationwide. But if you're unsure, check with your state ag agency. Now. Once they're signed, they, as I said before, they do become a legal document. So you've got to make sure that they can be stored securely and they're able to be checked if requested. The next step is animal health declarations. Now, as I said last week, that whenever I considered buying anything, I would request an animal health doc declaration. Basically, if somebody refused to give me an animal health declaration, um, I would not buy the stock. It just provides a level of insurance that what they're signing, what they're declaring is truth as is as truth 
it is as true as they know it. Um, because once they're signed, that that becomes a legal document and that needs to be kept for a similar length of time as NPDs now. Um, animal health declarations are good because it provides information on animal treatments that they might have had. It will give you your um, BJD score, so your Yoni score, any treatments that they might have had, vaccinations, or anything like that. So they're a very good idea. Now, the next thing is inputs feed and water. Now, feed and water are often things that particularly water gets overlooked in most biosecurity plans, but it is an important consideration because you're cleaner the, the, your water, you're better your animals do, the healthier animals you do, and the more profitable they will be. So, Good idea is keep them high enough to reduce contamination of feces and it, make sure that they're easily clean. So make sure that the plugs or their siphons or whatever the tanks are designed for um, can be cleaned, they can be scrubbed out. Now, if you have pigs on the school farm, they should never be fed any kind of swill including leftover food from canteen, lunch boxes, and kitchens. That's very important. Um, as swill feeding is illegal in most states, um, or it's illegal in most states and territories in Australia, um, that's a very important step. Make sure livestock cannot drink from contaminated wastewater. So if you've got effluent ponds, storm drains, or any um, channels, make sure that they can't drink from that because they, that does pose a health risk. Check areas around waterways for weeds and pests. Often around waterways you'll see weeds coming up, particularly if you've had minor flooding or flooding events occur, you'll have weeds check in and often um, it's a lot easier to stop them um, around your waterways before they spread across your property. Now the middle picture is a CVD or a commodity vendor declaration. Um, you can request them whenever you're purchasing any feed hay or any feed stuff. So if you feed other commodities, you can request a, a vendor declaration. So basically it will have information about treatments and chemicals that have been applied um, to that product, be it grain or be it hay, uh, the chemicals, neighbours crops, because um, that's an important consideration, uh, residue status, as well as the declaration. Now, similar to NVDs and animal health declarations, uh, you should keep them um, for a number of years, depending on your state regulations. Um, so if you do keep them, just check the state of how long um, they're to be kept for. Next thing is store food correctly. So basically, if you've got grain, keep it in a silo, keep it in sealed tubs, make sure that those silos um, don't leak, that they are inspected for any grain pests regularly. If you've got hay bales or silage, make sure you bait or you check bait stations or traps around them. And make sure you check expiry dates of feed. Mate, also, also here is if you store ram, so if you have chicken feed or dog food um, on the property, make sure that they're stored separately and they're stored securely to make sure that livestock don't have access to ram. So ram's restricted animal material. It's illegal to feed ram um, to cattle, sheep, goats, uh, alpacas and the like. Um, so make sure that if you've got ram material, that they are kept away from livestock, they don't get fed to livestock. Same applies for organic um, fertilizer that you might buy in blood and bone or chicken litter and manure. Um, same restrictions apply.
Now, controlling the fence line, so this is the people, vehicles and equipment. Um, we often combine them. Some te templates break them apart. So just depending on the template you're using, make sure you control your fence line. So make sure your fences are upright, they're secure, they can contain your stock and they can keep neighboring stock or wandering stock out of the property. Now, for school farms, rather than doing visitor logs and things like that, as it says on screen, school staff are recorded through the daily sign on and students through a class role. And then you only have to rely on visitor logs for external agencies or any other contracted personnel that might need to visit the property. Now, another good idea is provide advice to students, families about school biosecurity plans and the procedures, including notification procedures. That's just a, it's just a courtesy thing. It also makes sense. You want um, families to be familiar and comfortable, particularly if you're in a rural area, that your biosecurity plans and practices um, are safe enough and are secure enough to reduce the risk of returning back from the school farm to the home farm property or the student's farm's property and vice versa. Now, if you do have shared access, so if you share an access way um, with another property, make sure you fence off external gates. Um, if you've got tracks, make sure you keep an eye on them. You can monitor them. Next step is you can encourage a come clean, go clean attitude. Um, basically, we do that at work. So making sure that we've got um, clean boots, clean footwear when we're going out on properties. We've got different footwear um, for different locations. So I myself have got a pair of office boots. I've got gum boots for farm work and for work um, when, we're, when we're doing work on farm as part of my role. I've also got paddock boots as well. We also carry biosecurity kits. Um, so it's anything that you can do to maintain the come clean, go clean attitude. Visitor logs, checking students footwear, um, providing footwear, anything like that to create that little stop. Now, I know we touched on boot washing last week. If you do want to do boot washing, make sure you do a gross contamination clean first. So that's everything from a high pressure, pressure hose and a scrubbing brush. Um, and that gets the, the large amounts of mud or manure off the boots. Next step is disinfect. Disinfect your boots. Um, and my other suggestion last week is if you don't want to do footwear, um, consider having dedicated footwear, a couple of pairs of gum boots or gum boots on farm, or checking your students' footwear before they step foot on the farm. Um, they're all ideas that can be used. If you're unsure, have a chat to your um, state ag department for a couple of pointers or some more information. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to share um, this boot washing video. So this video um, has been done by Dairy Australia, which is the industry body for dairy farmers. And it basically steps you through how to set up a boot wash. Um, it's also a good resource um, if you want to show your students or talk to your students about biosecurity. Footballs are an effective way to minimise the risk of bringing disease onto a dairy farm from contaminated footwear. These are the items you will need. One or two tubs with hot water, a dedicated scrubbing brush, detergent, and a broad spectrum disinfectant. The disinfectant product you choose needs to be effective at killing viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Some examples of suitable products may include Vercon sodium hypochlorite, also known as Hypo, 
or citric acid. You can usually purchase these products from your vet or rural supplies store. Always read the label and ensure you follow the safety directions. Set up your foot bath station in a location where your staff and visitors arrive. You may also consider putting them at other important points, such as the entry of your calf shed. Mud, manure and dirt all reduce the effectiveness of disinfectants. Therefore, always scrub your footwear with water and detergent first and remove all visible dirt. It's especially important not to miss the undersides of your footwear. Once clean, thoroughly apply the chosen disinfectant on the sides and soles of your footwear. Most disinfectants need time to work, so don't wash it off. When finished, wash and sanitise your hands and sign in. Leather or suede is much harder to clean than rubber, so it is recommended that all staff and visitors to dairy farms wear rubber boots. You may even consider having a dedicated pair of rubber boots or clothing for staff and visitors on your farm. It is also a good idea to wash and disinfect your boots before leaving the farm. By following these simple steps, you can do your part to help the Australian dairy industry maintain our strong record on biosecurity. For more information, visit the Dairy Australia website at dairyaustralia.com.au. So the next step after people, visitor and equipment is production practices. Now, production practices are equally important because we need to know that what we do day to day during on the farm, even if it's only the school farm, complies with legislation, it also complies with animal welfare and best practice. So the first one is regularly monitoring crops and livestock for signs of disease. Most people will do this, they'll check the stock daily, they'll go out if you've got crops or horticulture, we'll go out and have a, have a look at your paddocks. Practice good hygiene, making sure your hands are clean, your footwear are footwear's clean, your stockyards are clean, that excess manure is cleaned up and removed, driveways or any access clacks, tracks are clean and free from manure as much as possible, that there aren't piles of rubbish lying around. Next one is keep a record of all your animal health treatments. Now, that's a requirement under most programs. Um, under your LPA program, you've also got to keep a record of that. Dairy industry, you've got to keep records. If you sell crops, you've got to keep records of any treatments that may have occurred. So that can be drench dates, vaccination dates, um, dates when chemical was applied to paddocks, the concentration, uh, batch numbers, as well as um, expiry dates are all ideas that can be kept. Now, review your production practices. That can, this can be done every six months, every 12 months. Basically, can you do better? Can you improve your animal health? Can you improve your animal welfare? Is it things like, all right, my crutch is getting old and out of date. Perhaps we should look at getting a new one. Are, are our yards still secure? Are, are our fences still secure? Are our tractors and spray units still able to apply chemical properly? Drought plans or emergency plans are equally important, making sure that they're up to date, that definitely if you've got drought or emergency plans, that they've taken into consideration what the what you're going to do with the animals, um, where they where they have to go if you if that's a consideration, it, whether or not you've got enough feed on hand and everything like that. Next one is storage. Make sure that everything is correctly labelled. You check use by dates from everything from feed to agvec chemicals, and then as I said before, keep restricted feeds stored separately. It just reduces the risk. So, as I said before, restricted animal material is any is elite feeding ram 
in Australia is illegal. Um, and it's basically linked to BSE or mad cow disease. So be aware of all materials um, that you purchase to make sure that they're not on the restricted list. And particularly if you've got visitors or school students um, coming onto the farm, make sure that they don't feed anything from their lunch boxes or from the canteens or anything they might have in their hands to the livestock, unless it's from your grain store and can be fed to that animal, make sure that that doesn't occur if not. And if required, make sure you ask for a commodity vendor declaration. Now, this is just a, a picture of a bag of chook food and what it says, basically, do not feed to cattle, sheep, goats, deer or other ruminants. So if you've got chickens on the, on the property, make sure their food is stored separately and that livestock cannot access that. Now, if you do have pigs on the property, there is Pig Pass. So that's the national tracking system for pigs. It's similar to cattle or sheep NLS system. It's also run by Integrity Systems who runs the NLS system. Um, it also has got pig passes. And as I said before, do not feed prohibited feeds or swill to pigs. Pests and weeds. Make sure you ask for a commodity declaration if purchasing fodder or inspect it for weeds and pests. Integrated management plans. It's a good idea, particularly if you've got staff unfamiliar with controlling weeds or pests. Um, you ask either a, a contractor or your state ag agency the best way to either control or eradicate or how to reduce or minimise the spread um, of coming onto your property. Also under there is fencing off old dip sites, rubber sites or dead pits. Old dip sites, particularly if you're in Queensland or the Northern Territory, if there was a dip site on your property or on the school farm, make sure that's properly fenced off. Rubber sites are similar, dead pits, fenced off and netted. Basically, we and if you do have dead pits, make sure that they're buried regularly. So make sure they're covered in soils as regularly as possible. We don't want scavengers, things like wild dogs or foxes or even cats getting access to that area. And we want to make sure they're fenced off from livestock. We don't want livestock straying into those areas and getting access to those animals because that can co that can have a similar impact to as ram. That's a disease risk. Now, outgoing product, ensure all livestock for transport are fit to load. Now, the picture below is the fit to load guide um, sent out by the MLA. You can find it online. Um, you can request a copy. Basically, it's in, it, it lists with pictures everything that you cannot send off your property. So things that are injured, that have got visible sores, um, that may not be able to stand, um, that are weakened or in a drought condition. Um, it lists and has examples, picture-based examples of all of them and basically big crosses next to them. So there, it's a very easy system. It's also a very easy document to understand and read. So make sure you're abiding by that and you're abiding by all animal welfare standards and regulation. Similarly, make sure you adhere to the NLS legislation of your relevant state or territory at all times. Now, if you've got a show team, 
make sure you only take healthy plants, product, produce or livestock to shows, sales and markets. That's very important because as we know, you can get something off a neighbour or off, off an animal you bring in, you can also transmit something. So making sure that you only take healthy livestock, it's very important, or healthy plants and produce, because the last thing you want is for that produce or that livestock to be the source of an infection. Now, if remember, if you do have show teams, don't share equipment with others. You take a separate supply of feed and water for your livestock. Particularly feed, make sure that any feed you do take to the show, the animals are used to consuming it um, as it reduce, it helps to reduce their stress. It's and a food that they're familiar with, they've ate it at their home property and they're more comfortable. If you've got water, um, make sure that you don't put any sheared hoses into that into those water buckets and you take the bucket to the animal, you don't take the animal to a water source. So you bucket the water to your animal, it reduces the risk of any shear of shearing or nose to nose contact that may occur. So the picture on the left is the NLS dashboard, the recent update. Um, and it's just an example of sort of what it looks like. So this is an example of um, the one that we have for the Agriculture Victoria um, when we're doing extension and engagement activities. Now, Lastly is train, plan and record. Often people overlook this, but it's a very important component of biosecurity planning that you record that people undergo training for anything that might happen on the property. So keeping good records, make sure your NLS records are up to date, that you keep NVDs, way bills, um, commodity vendor declarations, animal health declarations. That you keep your visitor logs and you keep records of animal, any animal health, any crop treatments, any sprays. If you're baited on your property or you put traps out, make sure you make a note of that. Now for schools, make sure you have a current emergency plan that covers all potential risks to the property and animals kept on site. So that could be everything from fires to floods to an emergency animal disease outbreak. Seek out training. Um, so there is a number of different resources that you can use. Agriculture Victoria has got a series of training modules that you can utilize. Um, there's modules in other states and territories that you can do. Um, you've got FMD awareness courses um, online from Animal Health Australia. Um, if you do have farm staff, make sure that training is offered to them, um, as well as it records on vaccination, particularly for farm staff or even for students. Um, things like Q fever vaccinations might be required um, because they could pose a bit of a risk. Now, if an issue does occur, Make sure you report all incidents to the school's animal welfare coordinator or your state animal welfare coordinator and follow the advice that they provide. Um, that's really important as we do know that schools are training um, training areas. So it's important that we recognise the welfare of the stock on our property um, because that is a big risk incorrect treatment of livestock does have serious implications. So make sure that any instances that do occur, you report that. Also, you report um, if you notice a disease that you haven't seen before, be it an animal, be it a crop disease, make sure you report that to 
the authorities in your state and territory, let them know, send photographs um, or any testing reports that you might have had done, uh, make sure that they receive them. Now, for further information, make sure you go to your state ag agency as they'll have the regulations and the requirements um, for your area. LPA, um, if you want the LPA biosecurity template or you want to register for LPA, um, that's through Integrity Systems, so that's on screen. Farm Biosecurity, they're a great resource. They've got templates, they've got farm plans, they've got biosecurity manuals. Um, they've also got helpful hints of how you can manage biosecurity day to day. Now, training modules were put on the Ag Ag Agriculture Victoria training modules um, section. So, as I said before, we've got a whole lot of things on come clean, go clean, biosecurity, um, foot and mouth and lumpy skin, as well as planning. So if you do want to utilise them in school, um, make sure you have a look, um, as well as Prime Safe, as well as the, um, the agricultural training modules that you can get online. There's a number of other ones. Now, I know this is quick. Um, so in summary, focus on the things that could impact your area or your farm and the risks associated with them. Make sure you request animal health declarations and you inspect and isolate stock. Make sure you keep your property identification codes and your national livestock identification requirements up to date, particularly for external contractors. Um, a visitor's log enables you to manage people, enables you to know who's coming onto the property. Think come clean, go clean when you're utilizing vehicles and equipment that that's coming onto the property. Make sure you train, plan and record any treatments um, or anything that occurs on the property. Next one is have a farm map. I know I didn't go into this during this discussion, but a farm map is a great idea. It enables you to know um, where your yards are, where people have been. It's a help, helpful hint of where people might need to go. Um, so that's it for today. I'll do questions after we've done um, the quizzes.